The death of Gilda Radner brought it to national attention. It was the principal theme tonight, as it has been in the past, on one of primetime television's most critically acclaimed programs. I have cancer. And it's changed you. Yes. But this is not an illness confined to Hollywood. Every year, ovarian cancer strikes an estimated 20,000 women, and most of them don't find out until it's too late. What can be done? How can we improve the chances for survival? That's our story tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Many of you will already have seen earlier this evening an episode of 30-something which dealt with the subject of ovarian cancer. It may be regrettable, but it's a fact of life that many of us are first sensitized to a major social or health problem, either when it's dealt with in a fictional context or when it involves a public figure. The television movie Something About Amelia helped raise the subject of incest to a level of broad public discussion. Rock Hudson's death did much the same thing for AIDS. When former First Lady Betty Ford had a mastectomy and then later when she was admitted to a clinic for drug dependence, those topics were suddenly easier to discuss. This year, it is projected that 12,400 women will die because of ovarian cancer. As with all diseases, the earlier it's detected in a patient, the better that person's chance of survival. But detection with ovarian cancer is difficult. That's what cost Gilda Radner, the wonderful comedian who rose to stardom on Saturday Night Live, her life. Gilda's story is the focus of Jackie Judd's report. What's all this fuss I keep hearing about violins on television? No matter how trite it seems, you look at these old sketches of Gilda Radner's and ask yourself, how could someone so funny, so gifted, someone who had it all, die so young? I remember when I, Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, first entered the field, I was real nervous. I filled out applications, I went to interviews, and they all told me the same thing. You're overqualified, you're underqualified, don't call us. We'll call you at the jungle out there. Woman's place is in the home, drop dead, have a nice day, goodbye. In her book, It's Always Something, Gilda wrote about the irony of a comedian getting what she called the most unfunny thing in the world. Really, don't, don't, don't milk the applause like that. It's... Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. Uh, I haven't been on television for a while. Oh, that, yeah. What, what was wrong? Oh, I had cancer. What did you have? Oh. <laughs> The ovarian cancer was discovered in 1986, two years after Gilda married actor Gene Wilder. During her spirited fight, she had several major operations, chemotherapy, radiation, and more. Like most women with the disease, Gilda was diagnosed in an advanced stage when just one out of every four patients survives. Ronald Luchter was Gilda's surgeon. We found disease spread beyond the confines of the ovary, involving both ovaries and the structures in the abdomen. This is a silent killer. It's a euphemism that's now ascribed to this disease. Because you have to remember, the ovary's about that big, and it hides down here in the pelvis. It took Gilda almost a year to be properly diagnosed. During the filming of Haunted Honeymoon, she began feeling bad. She complained of aches, pains, fever, fatigue. Doctors told her it was stress or a chronic virus. She was prescribed tranquilizers, coffee enemas, she even tried acupuncture before she finally learned the truth. A friend of Gilda's who beat the odds and recovered had the same experience. She says she was misdiagnosed for five years. I was treated with cancer, for cancer, with therapy. I thought perhaps it was an emotional disorder. There's no clear profile of who stands the greatest chance of getting the disease, but the risk factors cited by the American Cancer Society include age, especially women over 60, past experience with certain other cancers, including breast cancer, and never having had children. The tests used to detect ovarian tumors include a pelvic exam and a sonogram, and less frequently, a highly specialized blood test called CA-125. Taken together, they're expensive and not foolproof, so some doctors are reluctant to order them. Doctors are not God. 
And if the consumer knows something that I don't know, or they ought to ask. Tell me what you want. I'll do it. I think they ought to be more militant. Gilda's family history could have been a clue about what was wrong with her. Here at the Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York, they're collecting evidence that ovarian cancer may be passed from one generation to the next. I had an acute, very high, uh, very high stage ovarian cancer. And the, di the prognosis was not good. Lenore Goodman Rosa is Gilda's first cousin. She, as well as Gilda's grandmother and Gilda's aunt, either were suspected of having or were diagnosed with ovarian cancer. How are you doing? You're doing fine, huh? Dr. Piver, who has almost 400 families in his ovarian cancer registry, says a woman with two close relatives who have had the disease may have a 50% chance of getting it herself. That's like sitting on a time bomb. So that's really the purpose of the registry is to alert the American public that if you have this kind of family history, you need to do something. If you're worried about ovarian cancer... Gilda's husband will soon be seen in a public service announcement encouraging high-risk women to go for early testing. When the disease is caught early, the survival rate is 85%. And there's something else to be done, the specialists say. Ovarian cancer patients should be treated in cancer centers, where survival rates are slightly higher than the national average. And they should be treated by doctors expert in cancer of the reproductive organs, gynecologic oncologists. Dr. Larry McGowan surveyed Washington area hospitals and found that half of the women who use general surgeons or gynecologists suffered for it. The woman may receive chemotherapy that isn't needed. Or she may not receive chemotherapy because they don't recognize there's cancer microscopically. Carol made the statement to me, she said, when you have cancer, you don't have friends. And Here you do. Here well, you do. Who deals with the spirit of the ovarian cancer patient? Gilda Radner found her answer at the wellness community in Santa Monica. Sharing with other cancer patients, she would write, gave her the tools to be a fighter. And naturally, her tool was humor. She made up this fight song and passed it on to her friend. I am well, I am wonderful, and I am cancer free. No little cancer cell is hiding inside of me. But if some little cancer cell is secretly holding on, I'll bash and beat its head and smash it till it's gone. And for a while, Gilda did improve. In 1988, Life magazine celebrated her return. She loved it, but was deflated by the article's mention of how few women like her go on to live long lives. Gilda's life ended May the 20th, 1989. Gilda once told her psychotherapist, Joanna Bull, that she looked at her struggle with ovarian cancer as a school in which she was meant to teach and to help others. And in that, Gilda succeeded. I'm very happy that it's come out of the closet and that attention's being paid to it. This is just another gift that Gilda has given among the thousands of gifts that she's left with us. When we come back, we'll be joined by one of the nation's leading experts on ovarian cancer, by a woman who's been battling ovarian cancer since it was diagnosed two years ago and by a psychotherapist who helped Gilda Radner deal with the emotional impact of her illness. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Nuveen. My husband, Elliot, he's an inventor. He's made a very good life for both of us. Last year, this big company paid a lot of money for one of his ideas. Elliot even thought about opening his own company. But in the end, we decided to invest the money. Besides, I'm not sure Elliot's cut out to work in an office anyway. To invest tax-free with John Newbean and company, call your financial advisor or this number. You're on your way. Come on, everybody, let's go! I hate science. committed major funding for this traveling exhibition at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. If we can help turn these kids on to science today, we can help turn out world-class scientists tomorrow. The car 
I really wanted in high school and didn't get. The Mustang convertible. Oh, I dreamed about that car for years. So did Ford. Now look. <laughs> I feel like a kid again. It's no wonder Ford sells more cars and trucks in California than anyone. At age 15, his headmaster said he'd either wind up rich or in prison. He founded Virgin Records, Virgin Music, Virgin Films, Virgin Video, and two of London's hottest dance clubs. So much for prison. From a man who knows a thing or two about entertainment, comes entertainment in its highest form. Introducing Virgin Atlantic Airways. Los Angeles to London, starting May 16th. If only his headmaster could see him now. Before Oscar time, prime time, the big bucks, superstars, producers, where the money really goes. Hollywood from the inside on prime time Thursday. Dr. Robert Young, a leading expert on ovarian cancer, is president of the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia, one of 20 comprehensive research and treatment centers for cancer in the United States. Susan Ock Feldman of Pittsburgh has been an ovarian cancer patient for the past two years. And therapist Joanna Bull is executive director of the Wellness Community in Santa Monica, an organization that helps cancer patients cope with their illness. Gilda Radna was one of her clients. Dr. Young, um, as I understand it, the good news is there's a 90% cure rate if it's caught early, and the bad news is it's hard to catch early. Would you explain to me why? Well, that's uh, right. The symptoms and signs of the disease are relatively vague, and so, unfortunately, about two-thirds of the women in this country present with advanced ovarian cancer, and that's much more difficult to cure, although some patients, even with advanced disease, are curable. Uh, the signs simply don't point to the disease early enough that we can make the diagnosis easily. What methods are there, however, that can be, and perhaps even should be, used by more women so that you're going to catch more cases than clearly are being caught right now? Well, I think the most important thing is to emphasize a yearly pelvic examination that allows the doctor not only to check the size and character of the ovaries, you also screen for cervix cancer and endometrial carcinoma and a number of things as well. Uh, this really offers the first opportunity to, uh, uh, to define any change in the ovaries size, and that's the first tip-off to some sort of abnormality. Now, should, they, should they just be going to their, to their customary gynecologist, or is it necessary to go to a gynecologist who is also an oncologist? No, I don't, think it's, I don't think it's necessary to go to a gynecologic oncologist at this point. Uh, I think it's important to get routine uh, pelvic examinations by someone who is skilled in performing that procedure, and someone who's followed the, the particular woman for some time. I think often a change in the character of the ovaries is as important as their individual size. So that I think careful follow-up by the same physician is an important aspect of appropriate screening. Ms. Feldman, obviously in your case, it was not caught early. Uh, that's was correct. That, was that due to the fact that you didn't go for your annual checkup? No, that's um, at the time that I was diagnosed in June of 88, um, I had had a uh, baby 10 months previously and had had a C-section at that time, so I'd been opened up. And up until the time of my, I'd had a, di a pap test and a pelvic exam within the six-month period before my diagnosis. And both had been considered normal. What else did, I mean, when did you first become aware of the fact, because my understanding is that in your case it wasn't caught until it had advanced to what they call the fourth stage, is that right? That's correct, yes, that's correct. And, and I'll tell you what, uh, let me come back to you in just a second. Dr. Young, quickly explain what the four stages are. Would you uh, stage one is disease confined to the ovary or ovaries themselves. Stage two is disease confined to the pelvis. Stage three is disease that spread into the abdomen. And stage four is when the disease actually spreads outside the abdomen. Now, Ms. Feldman, uh, obviously you are, you are hospitalized right now. What, what kind of treatment are you undergoing? And uh, once you've told me that, give me a sense of why it was that the disease advanced as far as it did before any of the doctors who were giving you uh, care caught it. Okay, at the current time, I'm here at McGee Hospital in Pittsburgh. 
um, being evaluated by uh, a gynecologic oncologist, Dr. Alan Kunchner, for participation in an interleukin study that is being done for patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. Um, the reason I think that my case was difficult to diagnose was that following that period when I had um, my daughter, um, I went through a time of feeling extremely tired, but showing no other uh, physical symptoms. And as Dr. Young has said, um, ovarian is a very insidious disease in that it's not uh, located often until it travels somewhere else. And in my case, in May of 88, I was diagnosed with an enlarged lymph node on my neck and under my arm. And that was the first clue, really, that I had and that my doctors had that there was something going on. And by that time, I was actually a stage four. Uh, forgive me if this seems like a, a tactless statement to make, but clearly you know that the chances of survival when it progresses to the fourth stage are slim, right? Yes, yes. How do you deal with it? Well, I guess at the time of my diagnosis, um, I was given the statistics that Dr. Young has um, recited that I had a one in four or one in five chance of making it, at that time they said for a year. And um, I guess I felt that no one should die because of statistics, which is something that Bernie Siegel has said. Um, and I felt that I was very healthy and I had a lot to live for and that I hadn't used up all my options. I don't know that it's a rational thing. I, I was afraid, I was very scared, um, and I just felt that I would give it my best shot. And um, while I uh, have not had an unblemished health record during that time, I am very healthy at the current time. All right, Ms. I think Coleman, she yeah. illustrates an important thing, and that is while the, uh, the, the statistics, if you will, are not good even for advanced disease, they're not zero. Uh, there are patients, even with very advanced ovarian cancer, who can be cured uh, using some of the techniques uh, available at the present time. And you have brought us to the point at which I wanted to break, because I want to talk about the, the, the necessity of maintaining a good, positive attitude, which will bring us to our third guest, uh, Ms. Bull, and we'll be talking to her when we continue our discussion in just a moment. in quality, reliability. The quality of today's Fords, Lincolns, and Mercury's is no accident. It's engineered into every car and truck we build. We bump before you bump. We open and close. We break, we shake, we get in and get out. We freeze, we start. When your goal is to build the highest quality cars and trucks in the world, you don't do it any other way. At Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln, quality is job one. Looking for invigoration. Trying a real refreshing drink. Sweet and Ocean Spray Pink. Refresh yourself with sweet, tart Ocean Spray Pink Grapefruit Juice Cocktail. Ocean Spray Pink. Kmart makes your cleaning a breeze with a powerful Eureka Upright Vacuum. The quality you need at the price you want. $59.22. It's a sale. It's a big sale. Hurry. Yes. I want one. <laughs> I've always wanted a Jeep Wrangler. Wrangler. Cherokee. I've always wanted a Jeep Cherokee. Got, got, got it. Get special incentives and low prices now. Hey. See your California Jeep and Eagle dealer for the Jeep vehicle you've always wanted. Get one. So, who's the computer for? For my daughter. College. There are moments when gold MasterCard makes a difference. Uh, can I... Uh, oh, no, 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 I got this one. That's my dad. With more buying power and the best buyer protection. Ah! My skateboard. Master Purchase covers you for 90 days against loss, theft, or breakage. Dad? If anything happens, one phone call will replace it. Maybe I should carry this one. <laughs> gold MasterCard. The best gold card to master the moment. Proud soldiers. In war, they're expendable. In peace, they're dangerous. I will not tolerate two malcontents who think they have the right to start their own private little grudge war when the rest of us are in danger of being turned into french fries. Roy Scheider, Jürgen Prochnow, 
Tim Reed, and Harry Dean Stanton in John Frankenheimer's The Fourth War, rated R. Now play at theaters everywhere. Friday, Barbara Walters with Atman Khashoggi, the Iran-Contra middleman. He's now charged with helping Marcos hide millions. Watch 2020 Friday. Best Actor of the Year. Tomorrow, cast a vote for the Oscar nominee of your choice. Also, Julia Roberts. And later in the week, Billy D. Williams on Good Morning America. I just want to mention that if you want to have a pencil and paper handy, uh, at the end of this program, we're going to put up that number again if you want to get through to a support group on ovarian cancer. Therapist Joanna Bull is executive director of the Wellness Community in Santa Monica, an organization that helps cancer patients cope with their illness. Gilda Radna was one of her clients. Uh, I, I rather suspect she probably helped the other patients as much as you were able to help her. But what, what is the purpose of this? The purpose of the wellness community is to bring people together out of who have cancer, out of their isolation and aloneness, into enjoying a sense of community so that they can participate together in their fight for recovery. And Gilda came to join other people to do that. She certainly did have a lot to give to other people. She joined fully in the community. The psychological advantages of it are obvious and would be enough in and of themselves. Is there any evidence to suggest that when the, when the mental attitude is positive, that it also has some physical benefit? There is evidence. Uh, there are studies that are currently being done that indicate that when the uh, immune system is uh, in, is approached by positive thinking, positive feeling, that it may be enhanced. We don't know if there's any connection with cancer in that regard. I think that's the imp that's important thing to emphasize, I think, that uh, certainly the wellness notions of self-help and support the community environment are very positive. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about that. I think that there is very limited evidence, if any, at this point in time, that there is any truly anti-cancer activity associated with those kinds of support. Well, what we're doing at the wellness community is working on stimulating the immune system through positive emotions, and in doing that, certainly one's quality of life is going to be improved working with positive emotions. And I should say, Ted, that we are, in addition to regular medical care, we're certainly not instead of it, yeah. and many physicians refer to us. Ms. Feldman, let me, let me bring you back into this. Have you had the benefit of, of any such groups, or how have you managed to maintain your own positive attitude? And as I said before, you, you, you have an admirable one. Um, I would say that um, my positive attitude um, is partly due, in fact, to enormous amount of support that I've uh, received from my family, my husband, uh, and my friends. Uh, and I think that I also think it was in very large measure due to uh, f services that were made available to me, such as social work, um, a clinical, sp n clinical nurse specialist here at the hospital that was able to assist me in identifying and sorting through feelings so that uh, you could uh, recognize those feelings and work through them and not have them uh, not be stuck. I rather suspect that there are a lot of women watching tonight uh, who could benefit just from hearing you identify some of the stages that you've gone through. Well, I would say that initially that there was tremendous shock. Um, I think at uh, the outset that I associated cancer with death and that I wondered even if I would outlive the week when uh, I was initially presented my diagnosis. I think following my surgery, I felt a tremendous amount of grief, uh, particularly with this type of surgery. I not only had to worry about losing my life, but I lost the ability to bear children. And I think that initially that that caused me uh, stronger feelings of grief than in fact the cancer did because I felt like there were things I could do to fight my cancer and there was no fertility clinic anywhere that would give me back my childbearing abilities. And how did you make the, how did you make the turn then to a, to a more positive attitude? I think it was a, a process of just expressing and working through the feelings and I think that that sense of hope then when those feelings were not in the way naturally then began to rise to the surface. I think that it's not <clears throat> an all or nothing thing. I think that there are times when you return to that sense of sadness or um, fear, but I think that the hope also remains there. And it's a, every day I think that you work again, it's a, a renewal of that commitment uh, to, to continue.
All right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, I'd like Dr. Young to give us a sense of what some of these tests are that can be, uh, that can be used. We'll continue our discussion in a moment. I should be dead. Last year, as I was driving home, I approached a hill. I saw something more frightening than anything I have ever seen. I tried to get out of its way. It was too late. I had a head-on crash with a 28,000-pound truck. I'm still alive today because of an airbag in my car. Allstate supports airbags because they save lives and lower insurance costs. It's very rich looking, very sleek. It has the, the look and feel of luxury, but it's something to be, to be driven. I think this Infinity is going to make all the luxury car makers consider doing some serious redesign work on their vehicles. The Q45 luxury sedan from Infinity. If you have some time, we'd like to invite you for a test drive. In one out of two homes in America, people rely on Kenmore appliances. So you don't have to go far to find the best. Come over to our house. Kenmore, only at Sears and Sears Brand Central. It's GSA. Hey, I was going to pack that shirt. With the style that comes through. Picture yourself. Picture yourself. Maybe I'll just pack. Picture yourself. You. you. The idea here is to offer a sports coupe for people who want all of the elements of style, all the prerequisites of luxury in one place at one price. We'd like to invite you for a test drive. The M30 Sports Coupe from Infinity. Back, first of all, to psychotherapist Joanna Bull. How many, how many organizations or facilities like the Wellness Clinic are there in other parts of the country that people can turn to? Well, I have to make a distinction first, Ted, between the wellness community and other cancer support groups. The wellness community is unique in that it brings together people in a very elaborate program involving group psychotherapy, lectures, workshops, discussions, parties, joke fests, you name it, just all kinds of wonderful things in a community setting where people come together, get to know each other, Quickly, build extended would, please, families. It, uh, how many others are there around the country like there that? There are four wellness communities in existence right now. There are numerous groups that get together in hospitals or homes or whatever, and we urge people, if there's not a wellness community where you are, to find a place where you can come together and talk with other people about what you're feeling. As I was listening to your guest tonight, I was just smiling listening to her because she's talking about what happens when you reach out and talk to other people about what's happening to you. Dr. That's Young, so significant. Forgive me. I, we, we are rapidly running out of time. Dr. Young, about 20 seconds left. The most important thing that a woman can do if she has any concerns about this. Uh, listen to her body. Get careful and frequent routine pelvic examinations know something about her family history and her risks for ovarian cancer as well as other cancers and get into the care of expert physicians who understand this kind of disease and know how to treat it. All right. I thank the three of you very much for joining us, especially you, Ms. Feldman. It took a lot of courage for you to do it, and I very much appreciate you being with us. Uh, just, well, another, just another quick uh, look at that telephone number that you can call. Uh, I should warn you that is open only from 9 to 5 during the day. The number, 1-800-ACS-2345. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. This has been Nightline. This has been a presentation of ABC News, where more Americans...